truly, 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 not enough can be said about the eternal work that was accomplished this week. And I just want to remind everybody about that because even among Christians, sometimes people don't get genuinely, I don't mean emotionally hyped, but genuinely stirred and excited for the, the move of God. And what this church did this week in the midst of a technological society where kids are inundated and flooded with so much, it was so beautiful to watch them simply assemble with people who love Jesus and hear about Jesus Christ. I mean, I could hardly sleep uh, Thursday night after, after kids committed their hearts to Jesus Christ because that is real. Do not discount that. Jesus saves, and he's more likely to save people at a young age. And so what you invested here is an eternal investment. The work that was done this week at VBS is more important work than anything in the universe as far as I'm concerned. That's what it's all about. So it was beautiful. Now, on to another note. Boy, the root of bitterness. <laughs> wow. But who thinks Dave does a good imitation? That was awesome. I mean, maybe, you, you, you know, he, I, he can teach. I heard him teaching little kids over there. He needs to come up one day and go up and down the aisles and preach a sermon. Imitation is the best form of flattery. But anyway, um, <laughs> We'll just continue on. I want to say one other thing. I'm thankful for my friends Pat and David. I just want you all to know David's ornery. He's a great guy, but he's ornery, okay? Now, granted, a couple weeks ago, I did pretend to run him over, okay? It was just pretend that the car was approaching slowly. I didn't actually hit his knees, but, you know, I was just pretending to hit him. So apparently, and there are witnesses that heard this, he took his car and was lying in wait to see me get out of my car to see if he could run me over. I mean, what is going on in this church? And I just want to share a Bible verse with all of you. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. It's actually two verses. <clears throat> my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. <laughs> let us ambush the innocent without reason. And on and on it goes. Just, just, saying. I'm just saying. In all seriousness, how great is it that we can all love one another, that brothers and sisters in Christ can have the joy of the Lord, right? It's, it's awesome. I love it. Okay, so this morning's message, you're going to learn a lot this morning. It's, it's a wide content, even though it seems like, how much can we learn about 12 gates and 12 foundations? There's wide content here in Revelation, so we'll get to that in just a moment. Hope and Passion Ministries, we truly only exist because people give. And you would be shocked to know the number of people that watch that never invest, but God is good. I know this happens in churches as well. God is good to take a minority of people and help to fund a ministry. So I'm grateful for that. But if you have been listening to Hope and Passion, if you're blessed by us, please pray about giving so that we can continue to do what you do. You know, this is obviously full-time work for myself. It's part-time work for Bria. There's a lot of equipment involved. There's a lot of time involved, a lot of study. There's an email service. There's a website to upkeep. There's all kinds of expenses. And so we thank the Lord for providing for us through givers. Okay, let me go back to the title slide for today, which I forgot to recopy there. Um, I did want to say one thing before we start this morning's Revelation message. I made a couple TikToks in the past few weeks, and I wrote a few devotions regarding this, but there's something that's really stirring in my soul and excites me. We all know that the Antichrist will be revealed right after the rapture of the church. The day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And we know that, well, for all we know, Antichrist is already alive and well and ready to step onto the scene. We don't know. I mean, you know, I think John has often told me, say, have you told me before Satan always has uh, someone prepared to be the Antichrist to inhabit? You know, and, and maybe he's ready. Because here's what I've been thinking this past week. I, I read a broad spectrum of secular sources on the threat of artificial intelligence. You know, all these people have developed this artificial intelligence 
and that's a whole other thing. But the bottom line is, I was reading how the United Nations, the Secretary General of the United Nations and the European Union, which European Union is like a seedbed of that Western Confederacy from which I believe Antichrist will come. But these huge global uh, organizations are just warning of the terrible threat and saying things like, the world... All governments must come together and mandate things to protect us from the threat of artificial intelligence. And as I was reading that material this week and researching it and aligning it with God's word, the thought came to me, you know, you might have thought that it would have to be another pandemic or that it's the proliferation of more natural disasters or the threat of nuclear war, which things are really hot over there, all right, in Russia and over in the Middle East, you might have thought one of those things would have to arise to precipitate the one world ruler. I mean, things are already in place. We just need something to tip it over the edge. I now believe in my heart that it is going to be the threat of AI. And that is here upon us now. Like we're talking now. Like we're seeing world leaders now say we've got to do something or AI is going to take over and destroy humanity. This may be the thing. And it just gives me chills. I'm telling you, if you do not realize that the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ is momentary, you are not reading your Bible and you are not reading the news. Amen? It's getting crazy. It's getting crazy. Not to mention the fact that artificial intelligence could explain a lot about the image of the beast that's able to speak to the world, hologramic image, you know, holographic image, you know, with what they're able to do with artificial intelligence and people's voices and their images. Oh, it's all, it's all here. So it's exciting to study Revelation. Amen? But be ready, right? Jesus said, you got to be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. For the world, they'll be caught off guard. For us, if Jesus came back while I'm preaching this sermon, it's not going to shock me, right? If he comes back while I'm eating my chili at Wendy's later, it ain't going to shock me, right? If he comes back while David's making fun of me, it's... Da da it must be something about the name Dave. David, what is the problem? Anyway, okay, Revelation chapter 21. We're going to pick it up at verse 9. We're really going to cover verses 12 to 16. But Revelation chapter 21, verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare Joel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. That's where we left off last time. Now let's pick it up at verse 12. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names, the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. Amen. This is a powerful passage. I know it seems like a lot of information and you think what in the world can the Holy Spirit show us through this other than measurements and a layout of a city? How many of you know there's a lot? There's a lot he's going to show us. So Lord, we ask you this morning to take over in this place. We humble our hearts before you. We ask that you open our hearts to hear what you would have to say. We believe you for miracles to happen today. We believe you for people to turn to Jesus Christ as Savior. 
We believe you to build up and strengthen the church of Jesus Christ for things eternal. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us wisdom and insight as the great delusion of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We see the shadows of that great delusion coming upon the world even now as they are turning and believing the lie in a wholehearted manner. We, your church, need more anointing, need more passion for you than ever. And I pray that you would strengthen us and I pray that you would convict us to walk as we ought to walk, to say what we ought to say, to do what we ought to do. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Verses 12 and 13. So this new Jerusalem coming down of heaven from God it had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the 12 gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, on the north, on the south, and on the west, three gates. Now, John MacArthur first states here, this city has specific dimensions and limits. It can be entered and left through its 12 gates. At those gates, 12 angels were stationed to attend to God's glory and to serve his people. The gates had names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, celebrating for all eternity God's covenant relationship with Israel. Can I get an amen? Every true Christian ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of God's chosen people. You can see throughout all of history that Satan has been after the Jews. Now, I understand that most Jews today do not turn to Jesus Christ as their Savior, but I'm here to tell you there's coming a day when they will. And God loves them. And God is trying to get them to turn to him. These uh, gates were arranged symmetrically, there were three gates on each of the east, south, north, and west sides. That arrangement is reminiscent of the way the 12 tribes camped around the tabernacle in the Old Testament and of the allotment of the tribal lands around the millennial temple during the thousand-year reign of Christ, which is seen in Ezekiel 48. How many of you know that God is a God of order and that we build buildings and use mathematical principles and love symmetry uh, because our God does those things. And our God loves symmetry. Anybody ever looked at a butterfly lately? Okay, God is a God of order. He's a God of symmetry. He's a God of beauty. And our creative minds work that same way. Now, I want you to notice this. On the gates, on these 12 gates that lead into the city, there are the names of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Three on each side. This is most interesting. Now, I'm going to use the New Living Translation here because it's easiest to understand at just a cursory glance. So let me go through this. Let me show you how in the Old Testament, how many of you remember God had Moses build the tabernacle? You remember where the people worshipped? Okay, this has to do with the tabernacle and how it was constructed. Look, Numbers 2, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses and Aaron. When the Israelites set up camp, each tribe will be assigned its own area. The tribal divisions will camp beneath their family banners on all four sides of the tabernacle, but at some distance from it. Isn't that interesting? They were to camp on each of the four sides, the 12 tribes of Israel. The divisions of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun are to camp toward the sunrise on the east side of the tabernacle, beneath their family banners. The divisions of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad are to camp on the south side of the tabernacle beneath their family banners. The divisions of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin are to camp on the west side of the tabernacle beneath their family banners. The divisions of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali are to camp on the north side of the tabernacle beneath their family banners. It is most interesting to me... Um, 
I think it's in the book of Acts where I, I remember teaching high school Bible and I remember there's verses in the book of Acts that say, you know, the Lord has caused each of us, you know, to all the peoples of the world to go to different places and inhabit them for his own purposes. Amen? How I many of you know it's not a mistake where you live? God has orderliness. He knows what he's doing. He puts people in certain places for a reason. Now, at the end of Numbers chapter 2, verse 34, it says, so the people of Israel did everything as the Lord had commanded Moses. Each clan and family set up camp and marched under their banners exactly as the Lord had instructed them. So we jump forward to the book of Revelation and we see something that was happening in Moses' time which was over 3,500 years ago, again, we see a similarity in the coming heavenly Jerusalem. It seems to me that God does not give up on a plan that he has. Amen? It seems to me that if God has a plan, he's going to get the plan accomplished. Look at all that has happened in between him telling his 12 tribes to set up around the tabernacle and worship him. Look at all that has happened to Israel, to the Jews. Look at all that has happened in Christianity. Look at everything that's happened in the world and fast forward and realize God's going to gather his people back in the new heavens and the new earth forever and ever and ever. Isn't that incredible? Now, he has them go to... Uh, three tribes to each side of the city. I want to, I just want to, this happened to me the other day. I'd already had the message written and I was going over it and I realized something and this really blessed my heart. I believe every word of God in the Bible is there for a reason. I believe God does everything for a reason. Amen. Look at this. Those to camp on the east side, what's it say? Toward the what? That's the only, that's the only one that face the sunrise. Those to camp on the east side toward the sunrise. How many of you would like to be on the side toward the sunrise? Shall be of the standard of the camp of, what does it say? Anybody? Anybody? I, I, I saw that and I, I didn't read it in any commentary. I, I haven't seen anything written on it. But I read it and I thought, Hallelujah. You say, Shelly, why are you so excited about that? The camp of Judah, the tribe of Judah, was to be facing the sunrise. Weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. How many of you know Jesus is from the tribe of Judah? And it was no accident that God said, I want the tribe of Judah to face the sunrise. Because when you've got Jesus, your day has just begun. Amen? I believe that's what he was trying to say way back there hidden in the Old Testament. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, you are facing your brightest day. Amen? 2 Peter 1.19 we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Who is thankful Jesus is our morning star? And it would do us well to pay attention to the prophetic word. Shame on Christians who say, I don't have the time of day to try to figure out the prophecy of the Bible. Come on. This is God's word. Amen. And we should pay attention to everything that God has written until the day finally dawns and the morning star fully rises, not only in our hearts, but in the world. So I love that. Judah was to camp toward the sunrise. Now, Bible goes on to say it had a great high wall. Charles Swindoll. Regarding the foundations of ancient cities, Alan Johnson notes, foundations of ancient cities usually consisted of extensions of the rows of huge stones that made up the wall clear down to the bedrock. Giant stones. Jerusalem's first century walls and foundation stones have recently been excavated. Huge stones. 
some of which are about five feet wide, four feet high, and 30 feet long, weighing 80 to 100 tons each, and going down some 14 to 19 layers below the present ground level have been found from the first century city of Jerusalem. That's incredible. The old city of Edge, you can still go visit. No wonder you can see still walls from Jerusalem. How they were built is incredible. So when the Bible says the new and coming Jerusalem has a great high wall, I don't doubt that, right? We don't doubt that. We can, we can fathom that. Leon Morris said, the city was surrounded by a great high wall, which means that it was secure and inviolable. Who is thankful that the enemy cannot violate your space? Is that a, is that a good truth? The Lord has, has mapped out a boundary for our life, and the enemy cannot violate that boundary. And in the new Jerusalem, in the new heaven and new earth, there won't even be an enemy to attempt to violate it. But look how good God is to show us the security that we have and that we will have forever. Now, this wall cannot be meant as a defense for all the enemies have been destroyed, right? Great white throne judgment deposit of Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, and every unbelieving person into the lake of fire has already happened. There's no enemy left. And besides that, we found out its gates are never even shut. Who's longing for a day you don't even have to lock your door? Right? The walls are pierced by 12 gates, over each of which is set an angel. This will be a mark of dignity. For an angelic gatekeeper is most unusual. The gates bear the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. This heavenly city is the true fulfillment of Israel's high calling. The ancient people of God are not forgotten in the final disposition of things. Now, if you've not been a Christian who's cared much about the Jews you need to really be reading your Bible and you need to humble your heart before the Lord. Anti-Semitism is a hideous, satanic thing. Any form of racism is, but particularly against God's chosen people. And I love to know that God has never given up on the Jews. You know, we live in a day and age when the majority of Jews have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior. And it just amazes me to think that in light of that, in light of the fact that God used the Jews to bring us the Bible, that Jesus came as a Jew, our Savior and the Word of God came through the Jewish people, it amazes me that they have turned their back on God. But it gives me deep and wonderful peace to know that God does not give up on people. I've often joked that I'm an adopted Jew. It's half joke, half real. I claim Father Abraham as my father, father of faith, who believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. And I'm not ashamed of that. God has not given up on the Jews, and it ought to cause every person, every Christian to realize God will not give up. If he hasn't given up on the Jews and is going to bring them back to himself in large numbers, he doesn't give up on anybody. Amen? We got to keep praying. We got to keep seeking. We got to keep believing for salvation. Now, I know I went over this in a part of Revelation before, but I'm going to do it again because a lot of people have not been able to appreciate dispensationalism. In other words, how God works during different times with different people groups. All right? So, Romans, to the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. Now, in the Bible, a mystery is not something that's completely unknown. 
when the Bible speaks about a mystery, it speaks about something that was previously not understood. It was dark and shadowy, and now it comes to light. Okay? This mystery, Paul said, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. How many of you remember me vaguely touching on this or you've learned about this before? Understand the different dispensation God works in. It's very important for every Christian to know that we are living in the day of grace. We are living in the times of the Gentiles and the day of grace or the age of the church. Amen? Those are all terms that you could use. But there is coming a day when the fullness, and by Gentile, we just mean all those who are not Jewish, okay? There's a day when all the Gentiles that will be saved during this time in life will come in, and then God will shut that age, over, uh, close that age, and say, okay, the church age, the times, the fullness of the Gentiles is over, all the Gentiles that are going to be saved before the rapture have come in. And now I'm going to open up salvation again in broad terms to the Jews. So I want to explain this. And I have a visual that I use because it's worth, how many of you want to hear this again if you've ever heard it before? It's important to understand. In this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, that doesn't mean every single Jew is going to be saved, but Israel as a whole is going to come to salvation. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Now, Jacob is the one whose name was turned to Israel because Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Notice that's future. As regards the gospel, the Jews, now this is critical. Understand this. Look at, what the, look at what the Bible is saying here. As regards the gospel, the Israelites are enemies for your sake. Right now, the Jews are largely enemies to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They reject the Jesus who already came and say that he was not the Messiah. Do you understand that? Jews have rejected him, and that's hard to understand. But... As regarding the good news of Jesus Christ, they are now enemies for your sake. But regarding election, in other words, regarding God's divine selection and God's divine picking of people to bring forth his gospel, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. And if you're studying Genesis with me, how many of you know? God loved and still does love Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they are, now look at this next sentence. For the gifts and the calling of God are what? Irrevocable. God has a calling on the Jews, and no matter what they have done or no matter what Satan has done to stop that plan, God's calling is irrevocable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has put a calling on your life for his sake, given you something that he wants you to do. Your calling, it is irrevocable. How many of you have ever witnessed somebody running from God who God had his hand on that he wanted to like minister for him, live for him? It's the most miserable thing in the world to watch somebody try to get away from the calling of God. You're just going to be living in misery until you finally surrender. Amen? And right now, and throughout a lot of history, the Jews have been living in a source of misery, running from the true Savior, but God's going to bring that back around. For just as you were at one time the Gentiles, us, just as at one time we were disobedient to God, but now we have received mercy because the Jews disobeyed, so they too have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they'll also receive mercy. God brought the gospel first to who? The Jews. Jesus was a Jew. He came to his own people. And they received him not. And so because the Jews were rejecting Christ, God said, I'm going to raise up the apostle Paul and he's going to take the gospel to the what? To the Gentiles. And he started circling out on his missionary journeys, taking the gospel to the whole world. Do you see how that works? So when we think about this, 
We need to know God has consigned everyone to disobedience. Everyone has to come to the place where they know they're a sinner so that he can have mercy on all. The depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unscrutable his ways. You may remember this graphic just briefly I want to show you. You can see up in green there the two events that we're really waiting to happen are the rapture of the church and then the second coming. Between the rapture of the church and the second coming is the what? The seven years of tribulation, okay? Now, backwards on on the screen there, I have written... Uh, In the Old Testament, God was primarily dealing with the Jews. It's all about the Jews, the Jewish nation, okay? In the Old Testament, that's what you're reading about. Then comes Jesus, John 1.11. He came to his own and his own received him not. So after Jesus, the fulfillment of all Jewish prophecy, the Messiah comes through the line of Judah. After Jesus comes and the Jews reject him, God says, okay, I've been working with the Jews. I've brought the Bible. I've brought the Savior through the Jews all throughout the Old Testament. Brought the Savior. The Jews have rejected him. God says, now in my divine plan, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump toward the Gentiles now. And I'm going to work with the Gentiles. And that's what he's doing right now. He's primarily working with the Gentiles in this church age, the day of grace. Now you see that arrow at the bottom here where I have the fullness of the Gentiles. That's the verse we spoke of. I get so excited when I look at that. See where that line intersects with the vertical line of the rapture? It amazes me. I I know I preached on this a couple weeks ago and I re-listened to it and I was like, wow, there is actually a day coming when the last person who's going to call upon Jesus as Savior in the day of grace will call upon him. And until we're raptured out of here, we know that hasn't happened yet. So we're still here for a reason. And the reason is to get those people saved. But when the last Gentile who will call upon Christ before the rapture of the church does call upon Christ, we are out of here. And that, my friends, will complete what is known as the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, During the tribulation, it's still technically called the times of the Gentiles because you're going to have the Antichrist and the godless pagan nations ransacking the earth. But look what's between the rapture and the second coming. The time of the tribulation is the time when God moves back again and says, I'm going to work with my people, the Jews. There is going to be such a revival during the tribulation of the Jews. They're going to come back to Christ in masses. It's what God has said will happen. That's his dispensation. That's how he's going to work. So the fullness of the Gentiles comes in at the rapture. And then God goes back to how he did in the Old Testament. He moves forward, goes from the Jews to the Gentiles to once again work with the Jews. Okay? And that's why by the time of the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, we are going to have a lot of Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise God. Beautiful how God works. He never gives up. He never gives up. So on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. Matthew Poole said, the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, because as of old, only the 12 tribes of God's chosen people, Israel, made up the church in that period. You know, if you're going to talk about what is the church in the Old Testament, the church is Israel. So only God's elect and peculiar people, which were typified by Israel in the Old Testament, come in at the gates of this church. It is very observable how God affects the number of 12 in the affairs of his church. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. Twelve tribes of Israel were under the old covenant. The twelve apostles under the new covenant. Isn't that beautiful? And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. Look at this. And on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. First of all, I just have to say, I, I love how it's, they're called the apostles of the Lamb. Isn't that beautiful? I just love that phrase. It summarizes not only the apostles' identity, but our identity. 
If you're a disciple, you're a disciple of the Lamb. Why is he called the Lamb so much in the book of Revelation? Because truly, that's what he came to do, to sacrifice himself. But Revelation reveals that that lamb that so many people mock and make fun of and think how ridiculous as somebody who calls himself God would come to this world, that lamb rises up as the only one who can open the scroll, the only one with the title deed to the universe, the only Savior, apostles of the lamb. And so the gates had the names of the what? The gates had the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, the foundations have the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The gates, Israel. Israel represents the Old Covenant. How many of you know when you read your Bible and you say, I'm reading the Old Testament, you know that the word testament simply means covenant. It's the same thing. You're reading the Old Covenant, okay? So God was working with Israel under the old covenant and in the new covenant today, the one that we're still under, the one that we're still in, he is working, the, the apostles represent who he is working with. Does that make sense? So we're sh actually in this section of Revelation, as we see that new Jerusalem coming down, we're seeing the divine completion of God. He brings everything back together. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 Go home and read Ephesians chapter 2 this week. This is beautiful. Kind of summarizes what's going on here. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Who's thankful to be part of the household of God? I just thought to myself this morning as everyone was gathered and people were talking and we were getting ready to worship, I thought, it is so beautiful for people who formerly were not related, not tied together in any way to come together and the blood of Jesus is truly thicker than the blood of human bodies. And look at this. The members of the household of God built on the foundation of the what? The apostles and prophets there, there it is the new testament apostles the old testament prophets christ jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure you know maybe we've read this before and not thought of a literal structure but the new jerusalem's actually going to show a literal structure where we see this all come together christ jesus is the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the lord in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for god by the Spirit. That deserves a whole sermon of its own. Who's excited about that? And in my heart right now, the Holy Spirit's prompting me. I'm thinking about our people watching on live stream. We have so many faithful people from across the country and actually the world who watch us on live stream or by video. And I think to myself, it is a miracle of God in this technological age that we can be related as a house of God and be a structure built across miles and states and countries. And how does God do that? He does it by His Spirit. It's beautiful. We are being built into a holy temple. You are, how many of you know, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit if Jesus is living in you? And so I tried to teach the kids that night. I wanted them to understand Jesus' spirit, his own heart, his own spirit comes to take up residence in your physical body. And in, in, in another sense, you can think of it, his spirit is taking up residence in all of us. And if he's in all of us, then we are all what? Connected into one temple, built to be God's dwelling place by the Holy Spirit. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Build on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. I am so thankful for Moses and Noah and Abraham and Jacob. I'm so thankful for Jeremiah, Daniel. Who's thankful for the prophets? I'm so thankful for my man, Petey, John, right? The apostles. But Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. 
He's the only one that can connect. He connects everyone at the corner. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation of this whole structure. Charles Swindoll, upon the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, representing the totality of the Old Testament people of God. Upon the foundations were the names of the 12 apostles of Christ, representing the New Testament church of God. And I can't believe we're all going to be walking in that city together. I don't know, you know, of course we all want to talk to Jesus first. I've told you many times, I, I personally, really, you know who I'm craving to talk to from the Old Testament? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I really, ever since I've read that narrative and studied what happened there, there are so many things that are told to us and so many things that are not. Like, at what point as you were falling into the fire, did you never feel the heat? What did it feel like as you were falling? As soon as you hit the bottom of the furnace... Is that when you saw Jesus there? Were you, like, when did he enter? And when Nebuchadnezzar looked in and saw the four men walking around in the fire? This is the part I want to know. I, 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 this, this is, my mind is so crazy. It thinks about the weirdest things. What were you talking about? Like when Jesus came into the fire and started walking with them and they'd never seen the Messiah before and one like the Son of God, you know, he, Jesus walking around, what did he say to them? They were walking around, so they obviously weren't in distress, right? There's just so many things. It just amazes me that we will walk in the new heavens and new earth, like hand in hand, arm in arm, with all the saints of old. Wow. It's incredible. Thus, the city will be the dwelling place of the united people of God, Old and New Testament believers whose salvation uh, rises on the completed rest, that should be rest, on the completed work of Jesus Christ. Wow. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. Now let's talk about this for just a minute. This is a lead up to next week, by the way, when we talk about the cubic structure. But I do want to deal with a few things here. The angel, the one who was speaking to John, had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. Now, people, there's so many people, you know, what is the rule of Bible interpretation? Does anybody know? When you read the Bible, you take it literally everywhere you can unless you know it's not meant to be taken that way. And so, so many people, everything in Revelation is just a symbol. No, 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 no. There are some things that are symbolic, just like in the Gospels. There are some things that are symbolic. When Jesus says, gouge your eye out if you sin. You know what I mean? But what more, Randy Alcorn kind of said it this way. I think I have his quote coming up here. What more could God do if he wanted us to know that the city was real and actually had measurements? Like, why would he do this? Why would he show John an angel that has a measuring rod to measure the city if he's like, well, this is all just a symbol, so don't really worry about the deets. That's what the kids say, the deets. I'm trying to be cool. The details, you know? It's just a symbol. Don't really worry about the deets. That's what Taya would say. But when I try to use cool words like she does, she makes a face at me. It's not a pretty one either. Okay. But anyway... He's telling him, I want you to measure the city. So the Bible says he also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. Now, if you look here, I jumped forward to verse 17 to show you that when the angel's measuring the city, the Bible is very specific to say that as he's measuring the wall, for instance, it is, it is human measurement which is also an angel's measurement. Does, does everybody see this? What more could God do to make us know this is not a symbol? This is not something to make you hope for a greater thing. This is an actual reality. The angel here is measuring by angelic measurements, but the angelic measurements are equal to what? Human measurements. We have no reason to doubt this. 
He actually couldn't have done more to make it real and solid to us. Randy Alcorn, even though these proportions may have symbolic importance, this doesn't mean that they can't be literal. In fact, Scripture emphasizes that the dimensions are given in man's measurement. If the city really has these dimensions, and there's no reason that it couldn't, what more could we expect God to say to convince us? Like, why would he put in the Bible, get out, you know, a tape measure here, and by the way, I'm using real inches and feet, and measure it? Isn't that exciting? I'll tell you, the Bible is so exciting if we learn to read it for what it actually says and quit putting somebody's spin on it. You know, maybe somewhere in your past you heard somebody say, oh, Revelation's so mysterious and hard to understand. And then you get that in your head and you're like afraid of it, right? How many of you are thankful we can just read the Bible for what it says? It's beautiful. So the city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. In the New American Standard Bible, I want to give you how these measurements are interpreted. New American Standard Bible, which is a great and very accurate translation, the city is laid out as a square. And its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod. He actually measured it with this tool. 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. Now, uh, some scholars translate it in some translations as 1,400 miles. Some as 1,500 miles. Okay, we're not going to worry about that. It's around 1,500 square miles. But this is a 1,500 square mile cube. And you might be picturing, okay, 1,500 square miles length and width, but it's also the height. And you'd think, well, we're going to need some elevators in there because that's a lot of, you know, like they build ceilings really high, but your head usually doesn't hit the ceiling, right? That's a lot of space up there. So you think, and I don't like elevators. Anybody else with me? Who else hates elevators? Am I the only one? Isn't that a, a common phobia? Who? Levi. Do You don't like them either? Oh, you're just laughing at me. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, he's like, I go, you, you, oh, you're just laughing at me. He's like, yeah. I'll, I recently had to stay at a hotel, and we were on like the third floor. Stairs every time. I went to my, my dad's kidney doctor with him this past week, and I was so disturbed. It was only one level, but I couldn't use the stairs. I had to use the elevator. Oh, creeps me out. I don't like elevators. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, I would think, 1,500 miles. This isn't heaven to me if the elevator has to go 1,500 miles to get me in the top floor to visit Henry. You know what I mean? I'm like, he's living up there. I'm on the first floor. But anyway... But then I realized what I was explaining. I think it was to Levi or some, some of the kids we were talking about heaven at uh, VBS this week. And I was, you know, the one boy said, I think we're just going to be able to go different places like kind of fly. And I said, I think so too. Because, you know, when Jesus got his new resurrected body, which is the pattern of the kind of body we're going to get. And this little boy was really tracking with me. You know, I said, you know, when he had his body, did you know what the Bible said? He came in and he walked through a closed door and a wall like he walked right through it to get into his friends and he kind of was able to just transport through the wall even though he had a body you know you know he's like yeah and then I said and when he left in his new glorified body the one like we're going to get when he was going to go up to heaven he didn't have to go in a rocket ship what did he do to send it up and I do believe that we will be able to see I won't have to take the elevator I'll be like, okay, I want to go to the 864th floor. Up I go, you know. Anyway, that's fun stuff to think about. But the fact of the matter is, this is a cubic city, which is massive. The New Living Translation says when he measured it, he found it was a square, as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. By the way, Levi, you know, I know you're laughing at me, but hey, your name is not Dave. Okay? You're Levi. You're my buddy. All right, so got to get him turned back around here. Nobody let the Daves talk to him. Okay, um, Randy Alcorn, a, met <laughs> a metropolis 
a metropolis of this size in the middle of the United States, now think about this, at the size the dimensions are given, would stretch from Canada to Mexico and from the Appalachian Mountains to the California border. The New Jerusalem is all the square footage anyone can ask for. Now remember, the New Jerusalem is just the what? The city. It's just the city of the new heaven and new earth. The city stretches from Canada to Mexico, that big it would be, from the Appalachian Mountains to the California border. But remember, it's that high as well. We don't need to worry that heaven will be crowded. The ground level of the city will be nearly 2 million square miles, just the ground floor. This is 40 times bigger than England, the ground floor. 40 times bigger than England and 15,000 times bigger than London. It's 10 times as big as France or Germany and far larger than India. But remember, that's just the ground floor. Anybody want to shout hallelujah? This is incredible. Given the dimensions of a 1,400-mile cube, if the city consisted of different levels, we don't know this, but we would guess, and if each story were a generous 12 feet high, the city could have over 600,000 stories. If they were on different levels, billions of people could occupy the New Jerusalem with many square miles per person. But remember, that's just the city. We're not going to stay in the city all the time. We're going in and out its gates, exploring the whole new universe that God has made. Charles Swindoll, the size of the city in John's vision is staggering, nearly 1,500 miles along one wall. At this point, the dimensions of the city seem to cross the bounds of credibility, but we must remember two things. First, the extraordinary width length and height of the city were no less incredible in, in John's day than they are today. My goodness, if we think of 1,500 miles, we've got fast cars and airplanes, right? In John's day, they were walking or riding horses. What do you think it meant? As he was sitting there scripting out on the island of Patmos, he was probably like, what? In fact... One might say that in John's day, when 1,500 miles seemed to many like the distance of the entire inhabited world, the number would have sounded even more incredible to them than it sounds to us. Second, John himself seems to have understood these measurements to be human and literal, not spiritual and symbolic. So if the measurements are literal, how do we account for the massive size of the city relative to the surface of the earth? Imagine a city that big plunking itself down on this sphere, right? But when you think about the new heaven and new earth, God is going to remake this earth. We found that out. And one thing that I teach in, and you can get on my YouTube channel and access it, but I did do that message here some years ago. Ten things everyone ought to know about the end of the world. And one of the points in that is all the geographic changes that the Bible says will happen during the tribulation, and into the millennium. Lots of things are going to shift and change. So we don't have any idea how that new earth is going to look, how big it's going to be. Critics are correct that this massive city could never fit on the present earth, but it's, it will be perfectly proportionate to the new earth, which God will fashion for the eternal state, the new heaven and new earth. We're never told how large the new earth will be, but we already know that it will be geographically different from the present earth having no sea. And we talked about that, okay? So remember, things are going to shift because, uh, you know, Jerusalem, the throne of God, has a river flowing through the middle of it. Remember we talked about that? So there's going to be lots of changes. Uh, we don't know exactly what the new earth will look like, but we know this city is going to be massive. Furthermore, when we realize that this is the capital city of God's new creation and that its origin is from God himself, we should not be surprised at its incredible size. It will be the eternal dwelling place of countless saints and innumerable angels. I mean, it just hit me just now. God's bringing his dwelling place down to earth and all his angels are coming with him. Wow. I can't.
can't wait to talk to some of the angels who've had to protect me when I'm trying to back up my car. <laughs> right? Dave's laughing. Levi's not looking. He's like, I'm not going to laugh at Shelly. I know she's a good driver. That's right, Levi. You stay on my side. Okay. John Walbert, a city of large dimensions would be proper if it's to be the residence of the saved of all ages, including infants who died before reaching the age of accountability. And guess what else? All the aborted children from all of history. That's incredible. And God has them, each and every one. All the miscarriages, all the people in other countries who have died and gone and nobody even knew or remembered, his little children, people who were saved that nobody else knew. It's incredible. It's not necessary, however, to hold that everyone will live continually within its walls throughout eternity. The implications are that there is plenty of room for everyone and that this city provides a residence for the saints of all ages. And that was it. I wasn't sure if that was my last slide or not. You know, that brings up a good point. We as Christians, the issues of our day, we need to speak to them. We need to think about them. Amen? So since that kind of plopped into my mind, let me just say, I have counseled with and talked to women who have had abortions, who are saved, who have come to Jesus Christ, who have put that sin under the blood. And so I want to say that there is grace for every sin. Amen? There is grace for every wrong. But I think the thing that we need to remember as Christians and never let go of is at the point of conception, we have a soul. We have a human being. And every one of those babies, well, God is going to hold this country so responsible for what we're doing. There's so many things that have gone tilt. So many perversions. We need to, in love, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I never am a person to preach to pound on certain sins to produce guilt. Because I firmly believe that if I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and his word, sentence by sentence, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Shelley Prindle doesn't bring conviction. It's not your job to pound somebody over the head, to try to tell everybody every sin they're committing. That is not our job. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. The devil brings condemnation. So if you're on the live stream and you're sitting in this place and you feel condemned by some past sin, that is not of God. Conviction is of God. Conviction is different than condemnation. Condemnation pushes a person to hopelessness and a feeling that you can never be reconciled to God, that you can never be forgiven. Conviction is very specific and very sharp. The Holy Spirit will bring it right to the point where you are out of bounds, and he will show you that for the purposes of you being able to confess it and feeling the great relief that he brings as God forgives that sin. I just feel that right now. Bow your heads with me, if you would. Lord, I never thought of that before until the end of this message. That this beautiful new city will be inhabited by the countless number of children who have been aborted, killed, who never got a chance to grow up outside the womb, but who are nonetheless yours.
Lord, I was watching the news this morning, and ironically, it was about a structure that's being erected, a an apartment building, a complex that's being put up that's going to be, in particular, dedicated to perverted lifestyles for senior citizens. Father, we come to you because each and every one of us has committed grave sin against you. We could name thousands upon thousands of sins that we all have committed, and yet there is only one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that is the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. So listen to my voice through the live stream, the recording, and in this place, and know this. There is forgiveness for every sin, except the sin that you refuse to confess and put under the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask right now that many people who are feeling the conviction of your spirit towards a certain area in life, whether it's in the past or it's in the present, let us yield that to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that when someone sincerely does that right now, that your blood would wash over them, that your relief and your peace would come upon them. I thank you, God, that you are in the saving business. I thank you, Lord, that you restore our hearts to you even when they have been wayward, even when we have transgressed or walked over your rules, your laws, your commandments. You are so good to save. I thank you for the hope of heaven. I thank you that you continue to reach out to your chosen people, the Jews. I thank you that together we are the united body of Christ if Jesus is our Lord. Thank you for the moving of your Holy Spirit this morning. In the Savior's name we pray, whose name is Jesus Christ. Amen.